very much. Thank you. Welcome. And thank you for the organizers for having me here in Prague for my lecture, Gender Dimension in Mobility Research and Urban Planning. Uh, first of all, I have a technical question. Is uh, sound okay or shall I use the microphone? Uh, it's better to use the mic because of the video. Okay. So then let me switch it on. So. So, as all of you know, that uh, there will be also a video um, of the lecture, and that's um, also um, a little bit exciting for me. And I'm um, very happy that the organizers invited me and that I um, have the opportunity to share um, some of my um, results of um, some research that I conducted. And I'm also very happy uh, to discuss with you also about your experiences. I have uh, prepared a lecture and I will give you the lecture and I would ask you um, to, um, well, um, have your um, questions afterwards and um, I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Uh, let me now, first of all, introduce um, myself a little bit and my company so that uh, you have um, an idea where I come from. So, um, as uh, our um, speaker already has mentioned. My name is Ben Knoll and I'm um, a landscape planner and transport planner and my company is located in Vienna in Austria and um, I'm also working as a lecturer at uh, various universi universities in Austria and my main interest in lecturing is uh, gender studies in engineering. Um, and um, I think um, over 15 years ago, I started with um, a lecture at the Technical University in Vienna um, dealing with gender studies in engineering. So I have uh, the opportunity and also the pleasure to um, introduce gender studies to engineering students, so to students um, who do studies in architecture, um, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, but also um, ICT and other related fields. And uh, in the year 2004, I've set up my own company. Uh, the name is, as we mentioned before, BNK, Consultancy for Sustainable Competence. And the main interest in my um, consultancy and my research institute, which is um, basically an SME, a small um, enterprise, independent enterprise. Um, the main interest is um, integrating gender dimension in some parts of my fields of interest, so uh, engineering, technology, sciences, planning, mobility research, sustainable development. And I also work um, as a gender consultant and gender expert um, for European projects and also for the European Commission. So, and um, over the last several years, we managed to carry out um, various um, pieces of research. And um, it's, um, when I um, present the fields we are working in, sometimes people um, have the impression that it's quite broad, but in, in fact, um, our main issue and our main um, field of interest is always integrating a gender uh, perspective. So on one hand, we worked um, f uh, in the field of media design and uh, did a study on uh, self-representation of youngsters in social media. Uh, we have in Austria a very strong focus on gender inclusive language and uh, media design. Maybe some of you who are uh, also familiar with um, the German um, language, um, you might know that um, it's a little bit different than in English, and I guess it's also the same in the Czech language that we have um, specific nouns for female and male, and um, so that's why the gender inclusive language, at least in uh, German language, has a specific, uh, it's specifically interesting. And um, what I also would like to mention, um, I have published several books, also a textbook on gender studies in engineering, uh, where I um, 
well, tried to um, compile a state of the art together with my colleague Brigitte Ratze, and um, that book, Gender Studies in Engineering, also serves as a textbook for my students at the Technical University. And um, we have also a strong um, focus on mobility issues, and I will uh, come back to those um, pieces of research later on. And just because it's, um, well, due to the climate change quite recent, um, we also have a strong focus on um, gender and green and blue infrastructure. And we are always um, interested in the um, interface between human, so human behavior and uh, technology and um, artifacts. And we work, uh, for instance, with um, greening schools in Austria. And our job is um, to um, help the students and the teachers uh, in maintaining the green facades. So that's also one of our uh, fields of interest. But let me give you an overview about the lecture that I have prepared for you today, Gender Dimension in Mobility Research and Urban Planning. Um, first of all, I would like to give you um, an overview about some um, highlights uh, from the body of feminist literature. So I have um, selected several issues that, um, from my point of view, and I hope that these are interesting also for you. So from um, architecture, urban planning, and a little bit about the historical development. And um, I will also um, point out an example how um, gender um, is also embedded in methods, um, especially in the um, travel survey methods used by transport planners. And then in the second part, um, I want to focus on mobility patterns of um, specific and um, well, target groups, on one hand um, caregivers, and on the other hand um, a specific and dedicated vulnerable group, so people with dementia. And these um, case studies um, I want to present to you are um, some pieces of research that we have conducted in my company. And um, let me then um, sum up with some recommendations and challenges. And I want to present some food for thoughts um, from my perspective as being a practitioner in the field of urban planning, transport planning, landscape planning. And I will be very happy to discuss with you and uh, that we also can share experiences from Austria and your experiences from your work here in the Czech Republic. So, let me now uh, give you um, a little bit of a historical overview and um, I have also to apologize that I'm only um, referring to the German speaking <coughs> countries. Um, due to the fact that um, I'm located in Vienna and I'm not um, capable and able to speak Czech uh, language, so it wasn't possible for me to, um, well, to investigate how was the um, situation in the Czech Republic or in the former um, countries, so before 1989. But uh, let me give you a short overview about the situation and the development of feminist planning and feminist architects' um, development and um, their activities in the German-speaking countries. Um, I do not focus uh, on the first feminist movement, which was, um, took place in the end or in the middle of the 19th century up to, the, to World War I, but uh, let me just start with uh, the second feminist movement. And um, as you probably know, in the German-speaking countries, uh, the feminist movement, um, well, started um, around the 1970s. And uh, the first years uh, in the 19, 1970s, um, feminists, they uh, discussed about several um, issues related to women, to violence, and so on. And um, at least in the middle of uh, the 1970s, architecture and planning issues 
uh, came also into the fore of the second uh, feminist movement. And um, as we know from the history, especially from Germany, um, female students who did uh, their studies in architecture and also in spatial planning, they um, pointed out um, together with their friends and colleagues in the um, second feminist movement that um, planning issues and the built environment is really very important and feminists should also have a focus on our built environment, not only the, the social um, uh, inequalities, but also uh, looking at built, uh, our towns and our uh, buildings, our urban districts and so on. And uh, the um, feminist architects and planners, they also um, well formulated um, several critiques on gender disaggregated division of paid and unpaid work. And uh, they also um, highlighted that there is an imbalance when we look at the power, who has uh, the power uh, to change the um, institutions and change the system. And then they also pointed out that there is an imbalance uh, in terms of um, who has power for changing um, things. And then in the 1980s, um, it turned out that um, several of those um, activists in the 1970s, they um, published various literatures. Uh, in fact, it has to be uh, pointed out that mainly these literatures and pieces of literature are grey literature, and um, they uh, were uh, published by various feminist scholars and practitioners. And um, as for the German-speaking countries, and I will um, bring an example from, of the city of Vienna later on, um, starting in the 1990s, urban planning authorities uh, took up some, how and in some um, specific ways what they called female issues. Um, they t well, they took up these feminist or female issues ideas into planning procedures and um, I will present one of the examples of the city of Vienna later on. And from the grey literature I mentioned for the 1980s, I have brought um, some um, examples so that you can have an image and an imagination uh, what were the um, built environments um, the feminist architects and planners were talking about and were investigating and um, where they put their critique so on the one picture and the left hand picture you can see and maybe these um, built environment and these urban districts are also maybe familiar to you so um, skyscrapers and um, buildings huge buildings that mainly only serve for um, for people to sleep and um, the domestic work and the care work um, that you can see is um, in that uh, picture um, conducted by a female and um, the urban planners, they did several analysis um, how much space is there for um, unpaid work and for the paid work and they did lots of critiques also uh, on the urban planning in general. And the left-hand picture, that's um, a picture from Vienna and um, it shows um, the barriers, people having a baby carriage with them face on their day-to-day um, -day, um, ways and trips and paths. And um, so it also points out uh, where there are the barriers for people having caring responsibilities. And um, now let me give you an insight um, to one of the main important um, well, textbooks that is used by um, architects. And um, as for a preparation for the lecture, I um, looked it up uh, in the internet and um, the following examples that I want to present, they um, are published um, in a book called Bauentwurfslehre, that's the German title and it's um, in English something like civil, um, textbook for civil engineering and it, is, um, pub it was published for the first time in the year 1936 by Ernst Neufert 
and um, it is a very popular book. And uh, in the year 2016, the 41st edition was published, and the book is translated in 18 languages. So I'm pretty sure that also uh, students um, studying architecture or civil engineering here in the Czech Republic might also use that um, very famous textbook. And um, as it uh, is uh, mentioned on the website of the publishing house, it um, is considered as one of the most successful books in architecture in the 20th century. And I have um, now brought some um, pictures um, of that very famous Neufert book with me. And uh, let me please excuse for the quality um, of the slides. Uh, it's due to the fact that these slides were produced and I, I did photos, analog photos, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And um, that's why they have a little bit of a yellow um, shades. So, um, but uh, in fact, um, I did those pictures uh, not from a recent um, edition, but it is the edition from uh, uh, coming from the 1960s. But I think uh, these um, images quite um, they give you an insight about uh, what is the idea of um, that um, civil engineering textbook. Um, Neufert and his um, very important and famous textbook, they um, show what about um, what kind of dimensions should be uh, used for architects when they, for instance, construct um, and plan a kitchen. And you see quite, um, um, well, you can see all those um, length of the, of, the, of the room and what about the height and where to have um, um, the oven and where to have the kitchen boards and this um, textbook is um, really used also nowadays uh, for architects um, in order to um, get an impression about the standards and um, also um, standardization um, companies and they also and institutions they use these uh, measures that are published in the Neufert. And um, this is an example how to um, plan kitchens. And uh, we also see that um, architects also have human beings in their mind. And um, we see that probably two women um, are um, <coughs> visible on, on the left, on the right hand picture. And uh, it's uh, the a combined text, it's in German, and it's, it says something like, um, it's an um, impression of a kitchen for a small house and with space for the lady of the house and um, a part-time servant who is um, also helping um, the well, lady of the house. And here is a next, another example for how to uh, construct and how to plan kitchens. And it shows um, what about the distances uh, that um, someone, and uh, in fact, it's also, it seems to be a female person that she can um, use the oven, oven pro properly, and um, also the cupboards that are above her head. And when we um, have a close look to the bathroom, we can see that um, a male uh, person is uh, used um, for uh, the dimensions of um, what is what about the um, length of the bathroom, and when we um, look at the dimensions that are um, needed for a person to um, clean the bath tube properly, uh, then we can see that uh, Neufert, at least in the 1960s, uh, he used um, a female version of um, a human being um, in order to illustrate um, the different, um, well, activities you could um, think of when um, planning a bathroom. So on one hand, um, bathing and using the bathroom and um, the other, on the other hand, cleaning the bath tube. And um, 
I will, with the next slide, uh, and it was really um, quite of um, mm, well, a circle. It, it wasn't um, expected and it wasn't intended, but I think two weeks ago, um, from a um, um, private, due to a private occasion, um, I got. Um, a kitchen, a plan of, of a recent kitchen by um, an architect um, who did um, a kitchen planning. And it's a kitchen planning from the year 2019, November 2019. And um, these are the images that are used to illustrate a kitchen in the 1990s and um, in the 2000, not 1990s, sorry, in, in the year 2019. And uh, the architect, he's a friend of mine, and then I uh, wrote him an email and then said, oh, I'm very happy that um, I got that um, plan uh, and uh, I can use it in one of my lectures. And I'm, I, I, I said many thanks for, for that um, quite nice um, image. And then he said that these um, people that he used, so on one hand, the male uh, person just standing and um, maybe the female person um, doing some dishes, then he said that these um, people or these human beings are the standardized um, people that are provided by the software Archicad. So that's, uh, from my point of view, um, also um, a quite nice example that also in those um, um, software um, well, systems that seems to be so neutral that also gender stereotypes are included um, due to the fact that there is not um, a woman um, that stands next to uh, the desk and there is no male having uh, or using his hand like, like uh, the way the female person does it. So um, it's also from my point of view and um, one um, tiny example, but um, as um, feminist people or um, gender sensitive people, we should be aware that also gender stereotypes might occur also in ICT systems. So um, we have to be careful. Equipment is not neutral. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, in the 1990s, at least in the German-speaking countries, um, planning authorities took up um, some of the ideas uh, that were raised uh, by feminist architects and planners uh, in the 1980s and the beginning of 1990s. And I want to present one um, example of the city of Vienna to you. And uh, it's the so-called um, Frauenwerkstatt, uh, and that is, um, it's a competition that took um, place uh, in the beginning of the 1990s in Vienna. And um, it was um, for the first time, um, um, the city of Vienna, they launched a um, a, com com um, a competition and only female architects. Uh, were invited, and um, the job of those four female architects who um, got the, the, the job for carrying out the planning, um, the job was uh, to develop an urban district um, in the northern part of the city of Vienna, and uh, the main issue was that um, the female architects, they should develop um, flats and um, some and compositions of rooms within the flats that are as flexible as possible. And um, at least um, four architects, uh, they, the, the um, urban district was divided in four parts, but all um, the architects, they uh, carried out the same exercise so uh, that the um, room inside a flat is um, as flexible as possible. And um, I brought several examples for you where uh, the architects um, showed how um, flexible and um, which kind of um, families or um, groups living together uh, find enough space um, of their own in one and the same flat. 
So on one hand, the um, left hand um, example shows um, how is it possible that the flat is used by um, an adult <coughs> and by two kids. So um, every uh, person living in that flat has a room for one's own. So we know um, that old um, novel by Virginia Woolf, um, a room of one's own. So it's also possible to um, build flats for families where um, each person has a room of uh, their own. Also in the, on the top row in the middle, it's also an example that uh, the flat can be used um, as um, a flat for fee four people and um, all uh, people have their room of their own. And um, the other examples show how it is possible also um, two adults and two kids and on the right hand side um, also um, two um, different groups of adults um, living together. So m maybe um, father and mother and the children might um, left the, the flat already and uh, with um, an older person. And what is uh, quite interesting, um, based on this um, example uh, and this built um, urban district, Frauenwerkstatt uh, uh, in Vienna, the, the city of Vienna, they changed um, their planning um, requirements. And uh, based on these experiences, um, also um, the procedure of um, housing subsidi subsidies changed in the city of Vienna. And um, uh, the fact if, um, if it's possible that um, also a kitchen has a full window um, is um, now based on these experiences embedded also in the housing subsidies procedures in the city of Vienna and um, a special group um, who was um, also looking at um, those um, female or gender issues uh, in architecture um, was established and uh, took also an active role um, in housing subsidies procedures in the city of Vienna. So, and now let's move on um, from um, urban planning, town planning to um, mobility research. And uh, let me now give you a short um, introduction on common travel survey methods that are used um, especially um, in transport planning, in the transport planning disciplines. Um, travel survey methods and um, travel surveys in general, um, the aim of these surveys is to collect information about um, individuals, about um, individuals and their household circumstances and um, to uh, collect in-depth information concerning the trips and the journeys that an individual undertakes during um, a day. Um, mainly those um, travel survey methods um, are carried out um, as written questionnaires and um, the surveys, they um, have a specific given day where people should report their trips that they undertook on that specific given day. And um, now it's not the time to give you an in-depth overview on all those um, different items um, that are included in travel survey methods. I just want to highlight one specific item, and that is uh, about the trip purposes. And uh, looking at the definition from uh, coming from transport planning and mobility survey, um, they um, define a trip as an every stationary change for an inequivocal purpose. So that is really very important. Um, a trip is defined. Um, each trip has um, a specific un inequivocal purpose. So just one um, purpose per trip 
And that is really one of those basic definitions coming from transport and traffic planning. And that purpose um, that is, has something to do with um, an activity that uh, takes place in the public sphere. And um, the purpose um, is um, not in connection with the mode of transportation. And um, as uh, the travel planners, they define a journey, um, that a, a journey starts at a um, certain place, at a certain time, and each journey has a certain and only a single travel purpose. And I have brought an example um, with me to illustrate uh, what are the common um, um, categories used for travel purposes. And it's an example from Austria, so um, and the question is, um, what was the purpose of your trip? And then um, people who, are, who fill out that questionnaire have several uh, purposes that uh, they may tick. So it's a tick the box exercise. And the proposed purposes are on one hand work or work related, school or education, bringing and picking people, and then um, it's also explained, for instance, children to school, shopping, personal business, uh, and that's also explained. They say personal business might have something to do with doctors or with authorities, leisure activities, home-related or other purposes that are not um, in the list. And um, an in-depth um, gender analysis um, of those purposes show that um, the trips related to purposes such as unpaid housework or caring responsibilities for children or the elderly, um, these uh, purposes mainly are <coughs> invisible. And um, these um, issues and, and these purposes are even not raised in the questionnaire. And uh, one can further conclude that very important information uh, for transport planners, for mobility planning, is missing. So basic information on trips uh, related to, to domestic care or housework is, is really lacking. So one can consider there is a lack of data. And uh, further on, we can also conclude that decision makers in transport and urban planning do not have full information about the travel purposes of people. Um, and um, this uh, analysis and gender analysis of uh, travel survey methods that was um, the um, topic of my PhD thesis that I uh, conducted at the Technical University in Vienna, and I um, also pointed out that these categories that are used in those travel surveys um, reflect current gender stereotypes and cliches. And um, next to uh, the fact that there are um, also gender stereotypes embedded in those categories, uh, it's also um, important from uh, the planning and the urban planning and mobility research perspective that um, being on the move, so just uh, walking or um, traveling around uh, without a um, specific purpose is also not mentioned in that travel survey method. So being on the move as an activity, so for instance walking or strolling around, walking, taking a walk with the dog, um, or just walking around, strolling around without purpose, or um, having several stops along the way, these trips, um, they, these are not uh, reported in uh, their um, proper extent. So, um, uh, to um, show you some of those results, um, I have brought some results from um, Austria with me. So these results come from the travel survey that was conducted in Austria um, in the year 2013-2014. And uh, when we look at those results, and uh, we have to keep in mind that these um, results really, um, well, they, they 
can on, only show what has been questioned uh, within the questionnaire, but we can see um, also um, gender differences uh, when it comes to the travel purposes. The um, dark red and the light red um, items, these are those two items that are related to work, to the paid work and work-related purposes. And uh, we can see um, quite um, intensive gender disaggregated data uh, in that um, two columns. The left-hand column um, are the answers provided by male um, uh, interview partners and 40% uh, um, of all answers um, collected by mail um, highlight that they have as a travel uh, purpose work-related issues. Uh, and on the op opposite, uh, only 24% uh, of um, trips reported by females have the um, purpose work or work-related. And uh, that is uh, quite different when we look at the uh, turquoise um, bar, uh, that's the 12% for male and 19% for female, and uh, that's the travel purpose shopping. So uh, we can see um, gender stereotypes um, in the results of these um, travel survey methods. Um, when um, I did my PhD thesis on uh, the gender analysis of uh, those travel survey methods, I also carried out qualitative um, travel survey, and um, I want to present uh, one of those results to you. So it's a um, quite um, old um, illustra illustration, but I think it's um, also worth um, having an, a, a look on that because when we ask people um, in another way, not only with um, a standardized written questionnaire, then um, and I probably um, assume that that is uh, familiar to the people in the audience who come from social sociology, that when we use qualitative um, methods, then we get an insight of um, the day-to-day uh, -day life of people, and that is also that also applies for um, mobility research. And uh, this example that I brought with me, it's um, an example of a, um, a trip chain, a so-called trip chain um, of a person who has caring responsibility and um, the fact is that we have to um, start here with uh, the um, yellow circle on, on the bottom, and that's um, the home. So it's um, pe people start from, in that um, example, the person starts from the home and then goes um, to, the, to school and the kindergarten and then walks to the main square where those uh, white circles are located. Uh, the person um, does some shopping, goes to the pharmacy, and then further on goes to uh, visit um, a relative with health issues, brings some medicine, and then uh, the person goes to the stop, to the bus stop, and uh, takes the bus to the next bus stop, goes to the workplace, that's the um, circle with the uh, black um, inner circle and the yellow circle around. Um, so the person goes to the workplace and then in the afternoon station with the bus to the station, goes to the kindergarten and to uh, the home, to the flat. And then um, that example also, also shows another trip chain uh, from, the, from home to the playground and then by bus uh, to a bus stop and then to a swimming pool in the, that could be also some leisure activities with children in the afternoon. And um, what is, from my point of view, very important that we keep in mind, and uh, the results of um, gendered mobility research really um, points out quite um, evident, with much of evidence, that um, when we look at uh, mobility patterns um, of different people, 
Um, the differences are not due to the fact if the people are male or female, but social roles really play a very, very important role and uh, the social roles, they cause significant differences. So when we look at mobility patterns, uh, one main um, issue is does a person take over caring responsibility in their day-to-day -day life? Yes or no, and that, um, that fact really causes significant differences and not the fact if um, a person is female or male. Um, so let me now give you just uh, one short um, example about, um, again, the limitation of that um, written questionnaires. And uh, let's use the example of a... Um, um, the example of a 32-year-old father with two children. Um, the father, he might be a, um, a father who, has, who is now um, in his paternity leave and um, a father who um, carries out several activities and several purposes. And he's always accompanied by his two-year-old son and his six-month-old daughter. And the trip they undertook on a certain day is um, the trip takes them from their home. And they had, um, did several stops. They had a stop at the playground, um, at the pharmacy, and then uh, they further uh, went on to the bakery, had a stop at the grocery store, and then they went back home. And let's imagine that father, um, by, by occasion, um, gets um, a written questionnaire where he is um, asked to fill out um, the mobility survey for that specific date. And um, so when filling out the travel survey, what options should be um, ticked and which option and which item should the father uh, tick for describing um, his travel purposes properly. So if we think about should he just uh, tick the box for work, well, he's um, on his paternity leave, so in fact um, somehow it has, it, at least in Austria, it's only possible to um, take maternity or paternity leave when you um, have um, an employment. So without an employment, it's not possible for, at least uh, in, in the Austrian system, to um, do a paternity leave. So in fact, it has something to do with his um, working um, day or with his um, working duties. Um, but the question is, can his flat or his home be considered as his working place as a father on paternity leave. Uh, the next um, possibility maybe might be bringing and picking up people. So on one hand, uh, this purpose um, should be um, ruled out because um, the son was not uh, brought to a childcare facility, but um, maybe it father considered that as an option because he um, took or the brought, so to say, the son and the daughter to the play playground, but he didn't pick them up. He stayed um, at the playground and looked after the children. So shopping, yes, of course, he did some shopping, but what about the time he spent at the playground? Personal business, um, maybe that could be an option, but uh, in fact, uh, the father did not uh, carry out any personal businesses, neither at the playground nor at the shop where he bought some um, medicine at the pharmacy. He bought some medicine for the children, um, and not at the bakery because he bought a snack for the hungry children. So maybe a personal business could be ticked if we take into consideration that maybe the father bought a newspaper um, at the grocery shop for his own pleasure. Leisure activities, that could be uh, a possibility that could be ticked. Um, and um, other or home related. And I think with that example, it becomes quite clear that um, when we look from um, 
those different and quite complex um, travel purposes that people with caring responsibilities have that these um, quantitative um, well, questionnaires really have um, some limitations. And last but not least, there is also one very, very important issue that is missing um, in those uh, travel surveys. Um, now I'm just focusing on the travel purposes, but in general, these uh, travel surveys, they never ask the question, do you have um, a combined people? Do you take, undertake the trip with other people? So that is really uh, one very, very important issue. Uh, and I always wonder and, um, why the, the engineers and um, mobility and transport planners are mainly um, while well, coming from the technical disciplines that they, um, well, miss asking that um, from a quantitative, quantitative perspective, quite important issue, with whom did you undertake the trip? So um, let's move on to one of, uh, to the two case studies. Um, I want to present to you. So I mentioned in the beginning that I have brought two case studies um, with me, uh, some results from um, pieces of research uh, we carried out um, in my company in the last um, few years. Um, in fact, um, when we look at um, the several research projects um, I've been carrying out in the field of mobility, I'm always interested in a qualitative approach and I'm very interested in the mobility patterns and um, in the ch challenges, neglected groups and um, groups that are mainly neglected in planning issues face in their day-to-day -day mobility and in their day-to-day -day trips. And let me first of all um, present some uh, results of a project that we carried out um, uh, and that research was commissioned by the Federal Ministry of Transport Innovation and Technology in Austria. And um, it was a qualitative study that um, was somehow um, commissioned in addition to the quantitative um, travel survey uh, that the Commission uh, carried out. And I mentioned that before, it was uh, the travel survey from uh, 2014, 2013 and 14. And due to the fact that I did my uh, PhD on, on, that tr on, on these travel surveys, um, somehow and due to maybe some meetings I had with uh, people and responsible people in the ministry, uh, people were aware of, about my, my um, PhD thesis. And then when it came up to uh, that they um, carried out a new quantitative um, travel survey study for Austria, then um, the ministry um, asked me um, to carry out also a qualitative um, piece of study. And um, we were very, very happy about that project. It was a quite, um, well, big project, uh, let's say. And uh, we had the opportunity um, to carry out face-to-face um, -face interviews, over 140 interviews uh, in six different regions in Austria. And um, the fact uh, we choose, um, we have chosen six um, regions was that um, we tried to have um, a quite um, good overview of the si different um, built and, and uh, spatial situations in Austria. As maybe you are aware, we have in, in Austria uh, the city of Vienna, which is the capital, and it's the only uh, really big city in Vienna. So we had one um, region with the inner city districts um, of the city of Vienna with um, a dense public transportation system and uh, major infrastructure facilities. Then uh, we have chosen two cities, two smaller cities. Uh, on one hand, the city of Graz, which is the second largest city in Vienna, and then the city of Eisenstadt in Burgenland, which is um, on one hand a regional 
state capital. Uh, but on the other hand, it is uh, really due to the size, really serves as an example for mid-sized cities in Austria with a lower level of uh, public transport service and um, with uh, a high level of public services infrastructure such as public authorities, secondary schools and so on. And then we had um, three different types of rural areas. On one hand, um, the northern part of Lower Austria, which is a peripheral rural area with uh, wide spread villages and smaller cities. Then um, a specific region uh, in the Tyrol that is now uh, also in the media because they face uh, lots of um, disaster from uh, the, the snow and, uh, and the rain over the last uh, few weeks. And that region serves as um, an example for Alpine, uh, of a, for an Alpine rural narrow valley. Um, and um, this, well, typical for those narrow valleys in, in the inner Alpine um, areas is that they have um, an ex approximately 500 meters of altitude distance between the lowest and the highest point of developed areas and they have really a limited supply of public transport. And then uh, we also had uh, another region in the th in south of Burgenland that was also investigated. And um, based on these um, over, over 140 in-depth interviews, um, I want to uh, highlight uh, just one um, um, result to you so that um, we can also, um, so on, on one hand, um, step one, uh, go one step further um, of the image of the trip chain that I changed, chained that I um, presented to you earlier, and um, I want to give you an overview. Um, what is the um, fact, and how do um, trip change and trip chains? Um, develop and become more and more complex due to um, caregiving responsibilities. Um, those interviews that we um, undertook, they, uh, we uh, did the interviews with people who have caring responsibilities on one hand for smaller children, but also for um, adults um, who, have, uh, who, who need uh, special support. And uh, we also had um, some people who have um, caring responsibility for um, young children or um, older children who, ha who um, suffer from um, um, permanent diseases. So um, we did not only focus on um, people who having, uh, um, have a baby carriage um, in their day-to-day, uh, trips and trip chains, but also uh, what about the needs and the specific mobility patterns of people who take over caring responsibilities for the elderly or for people with um, severe diseases. And um, it turned out when we analyzed all those different trip chains, we also used um, a method um, and, and asked the people um, to draw their um, specific trip change from, from the other day. So we really had a, a huge um, load of, of information and uh, we um, compiled all those information and then we developed also um, an image and um, well, um, uh, uh, well, an imagination of um, how is it, um, how become those trip change, um, how do they develop from simple to um, highly complex trip change, trip chains. Um, and um, to understand that um, image, let me now um, give you an overview how it, how it is, um, how that um, illustration should be read. So um, this illustration is uh, really one of our um, core research outputs and um, shows the different mobility patterns from the simple one to a very complex one. And uh, one of those uh, factors that um, 
uh, have really a, a very um, huge impact on the complexity of uh, trip change is uh, the places of, of activities. And the places of, of activities are labeled with circles. And on one hand, we have uh, those small circles for activities which take um, a short while. And the bigger circles for activities that um, take a longer while. And um, when people have to change the mode of transport, that is illustrated with um, those small um, black elements. And um, these small black elements, they um, also indicate the change of transport mo modes. And um, that is um, also used, um, the term stage is also used in the transport planning. So um, if you change um, the mode of transport, then um, it is the same trip, but you, uh, the trip is um, divided in several stages. And uh, when you change your mode of transport, that um, may also um, cause some waiting time. And that is also something due from the perspective of caretakers um, might lead also to a higher complexity of the trip chain. And the waiting time in that image and in that illustration is uh, indicated with that round shadow you can see in the bottom also. In and of course, one element um, of the mobility of caregivers might also be accombined trips. So trips uh, where that um, the person undertakes with others. And these accombined trips are illustrated with the dotted lines. So, and um, in fact, the um, image and the illustration on the um, right hand side that really shows um, a very complex trip chain. And um, that mobility pattern is one that uh, people who take over caring responsibilities for others uh, really um, face quite often in their day to day trips. So, uh, they have um, several places of activities. They have um, accombined um, trips where they accombine other people. They have waiting times. And all these um, complexity lead to the fact that um, the trip chain for people with caring responsibility are not that easy to understand. And uh, in fact, and that is really the, the, my main message that I also spread to um, transport planners in public authorities that um, transport planners really have to be aware of, of all those complexities of uh, trip chain. And um, as transport planners, we have also to think about what does it mean um, in the built environment? What does um, that complexity mean, for instance, when it comes to um, the quality of stations or the quality of vehicles? So what does it mean if people um, accombine small children or uh, people accompanying people with um, severe diseases, what do they need when they use, for instance, public transport systems? And this um, information, I think, is uh, very important that the decision makers also take into account. Um, well, um, to sum up uh, those factors of um, complexity, so we, I have already mentioned um, the activities and, and the stages that uh, the more activities, the more stages, the more complex um, a trip chain will be. And um, one specific um, issue we also um, came across when we talked with um, people with caring responsibilities that uh, caregivers, um, especially if they um, have to take care of um, people, for instance, with um, diseases, then uh, they sometimes have to take special items with them. So um, on one hand, it might be um, a baby carriage that is quite familiar, but um, other items um, med for medical reasons, for instance, also might be important for the caregivers to take along with them when they um, go on and do their, undertake their 
trips. So an extensive planning on some sometimes um, maybe uh, the pre phase of a trip so that um, especially caregivers have to um, have a close look on the pre-trip phase and not only on the on-trip phase. Um, accessibility is also a crucial precondition for the mobility of um, caretakers and especially caregivers, so transport and barriers. Awareness, safety are also um, important issues. And um, when it comes to um, the needs of um, the combined people, um, that m might somehow be also um, related to um, the issue of flexibility. So sometimes uh, the needs of combined people are the crucial factor that uh, causes um, also a lack of flexibility. And I've um, now um, brought some images um, with me that might also illustrate the complexity of um, people with caring responsibilities and their mobility patterns. Uh, on one hand, um, looking at time as a determined factor, uh, that image uh, might uh, give and highlight how it is, uh, what, what is the Time, what are the time constraints that uh, people with caring responsibilities might face when they have to um, organize their uh, daily routes, daily routines, also uh, with the schedule of, for instance, public transport systems and the schedules of schools or kindergartens. Commuting, um, in this example, we have um, some um, people uh, are commuting by bicycle. That is also one of those uh, challenges people with caring responsibilities might face. Uh, and that is also something that is, I don't know exactly about the uh, legislation and the regulation here in Czech Republic, if it's uh, allowed that uh, children ride their bikes um, on the pathway. So that is um, also something where people might face also some challenges due to the regulation. And um, a situation that uh, might be also familiar for people who are... Um, who walk quite often in narrow streets. So uh, walking and um, the limitations of built environments for pedestrians. And there is also a specific um, well situation. And I guess it's uh, also the same here in Czech Republic as it is in Austria that the um, traffic signs for, and in here in this example, it's a traffic sign that is um, absolutely dedicated to cars, and that traffic sign is located on the um, area that is dedicated for the pedestrians. So um, that's also somehow and somewhere um, an indication about power and who, uh, which mode of transportation has which power in our towns and cities. So, and um, let me show you uh, uh, that, that example. It's about, uh, it's an example um, in front of a school and um, we uh, said it's, uh, and we pointed out um, the situation in front of a school at um, half past eight in the morning. So that's um, just uh, short before um, school starts in Austria and that situation was uh, described um, very, very often in our um, over 140 interviews and um, parents and um, caring um, caregivers um, of young children, they really um, explained um, several situations where people are, or, um, where the, the people uh, face um, challenges and where the pupils really um, somewhere and somehow are really quite in the danger. Uh, maybe you also um, are, maybe it's also a fact in, in Czech Republic, but in, in fact in, in Austria, not only in Vienna, but also in smaller villages, uh, it is the fact that quite often um, parents um, go by car with their children to school, and then um, the parents really they cause uh, traffic 
problems themselves. And, uh, and it's a little bit of a vicious circle because uh, parents, they tend to say, it's so dangerous, I can't, uh, it's not possible for my child to walk to school. But on the other hand, they are really the problem because they ride with their or they go by their cars to, to schools. And um, that issue um, is um, now in the city of Vienna and also in other areas in Austria taken up by um, somehow, sometimes by um, planning authorities um, or uh, by other departments um, in the public administration, mainly uh, the social department or um, the department that is responsible for health issues. And they carry out um, pilot projects. On one hand, um, awareness raising campaigns that uh, lead to more awareness among the students and among the pupils um, and in, at schools and in kindergartens that uh, the students and the children more often walk to school and they collect um, some stickers. So the more often they walk, the more stickers they get. So that's something of a kind of um, gamification, um, gamification um, approach and um, that also leads to um, awareness raising among the students. And on the other hand, um, some um, planning authorities, and there are some examples also in the city of Vienna, they um, do and they um, well carry out some uh, temporary bans on driving around um, school buildings. So um, adults are not allowed to drive their um, kids um, long um, to, the, to the schools, uh, to the, in the front of the schools. They have to stop with their vehicles, um, let's say 200 um, meters um, far away from uh, the schools. And that temporary ban of driving um, is one of those um, measures that um, also might um, lead to some changes in the behavior. So uh, now let's uh, move on from um, children and from people uh, who uh, take caring responsibilities uh, for children or for youngsters and for sick people. Uh, let me now uh, give you an insight of a recent project uh, and recent projects where we, um, together with um, other with um, other research institutes, um, focused on a de um, dedicated um, group of vulnerable people and um, a group of um, people that is uh, quite um, well un recognized uh, in mobility research so far, people with dementia. And when we uh, look at the situation in Austria, around 130,000 people with dementia are currently living in Austria. Austria, a country with eight, nearly 8.5 million inhabitants. And uh, we know from the statistics that most of uh, the people with dementia uh, live at home as long as possible after being diagnosed with um, dementia. And um, due to the, um, well, the stages of dementia, uh, um, people with dementia and their relatives and their um, caregivers undergo um, a process of uh, withdrawing from various social activities. And uh, that is also, as we know from um, research, also accompanied by a reduction um, of their <coughs> mobility in public space. And on the other hand, um, mobility and especially mobility in public spaces um, can also be seen as one of um, a main human um, need for, for people to be active. Uh, the Austrian, in, in Austria, um, the so-called dementia strategy was published in the year 2015. And due to that um, Austrian dementia strategy, that is um, a strategy uh, that is not only developed, was not only developed by the Ministry of Social Affairs, but also in a, um, together with other um, ministries. Um, it, turned out that also the um, 
Ministry um, of um, Transport Innovation and Technology, who is responsible for, mil for mobility research uh, programs, also funded um, a project um, called Dementia on the Move. And um, in um, a group of four organizations, it was my company, then uh, University of Vienna, uh, Wiener Linien, which is the public transport operator of the city of Vienna, and um, a company uh, who um, has um, several nursing and caring homes for people with dementia. We um, built up a consortium and carried out that participation qualitative research project focusing on the daily mobility patterns of people with dementia. And uh, due to the fact that we were an interdisciplinary um, research team, we used um, several um, research methods, so narrative interviews, a combined walks, usability tests, and focus groups. And I want uh, just to highlight uh, the a combined walks that we undertook. And these um, a combined walks um, were really, uh, from my perspective, and uh, when I uh, compare all my um, pieces of research that I conducted so far, it's really one of the most um, highlights and those um, pieces of research that I that were really um, very, very pleasing for me because um, we asked um, people um, in nursing homes or people living at home or people who um, go to daycare um, centers where they um, get some daycare uh, for especially f and, and some trainings especially for people with dementia. We asked um, these people um, if they are willing to um, take part in our, p in our research then we, asked, we told them that they, it's possible that they can have a talk or a walk. And it was so really very pleasing that um, people with dementia, they were so happy that um, they could take part in our piece of research and uh, to undertake those a combined walks with us. And um, due to the fact that we um, did research with a vulnerable group, group of people, people with dementia, uh, we also uh, undertook um, an ethical review before starting um, with the research and we uh, worked out a very uh, comprehensive informed consent and uh, we did also uh, talk about uh, opt-out procedures uh, in the case of uh, that people uh, wanted to opt out of the research during um, the walk or the interview takes place. Um, and just uh, to add as a footnote, we also managed to have, um, and that is uh, for, for me as a researcher not working at university also a highlight, um, we managed and got accepted um, in a very um, well high quality uh, peer-reviewed journal uh, where we reflect our um, ethical issues and also our ethical uh, cases that uh, we and our ethical challenges and challenging situations we met in our pieces of research and unfortunately that um, paper is only available in, in German but um, if you are interested in, I can also give you some insights um, later on on that and I'm also quite happy that um, yeah people who are not um, part of the university and the um, ivory tower also have the opportunity to uh, publish a peer-reviewed paper on that issue. But uh, let's um, have a closer look on the results um, of um, those a combined walks. Um, we, un we did the walks with um, altogether 15 people um, in the city of Vienna and uh, the walks took place from December 2016 to June 2017. And I brought some results uh, with me uh, showing mobility patterns of people with dementia. And uh, we compiled um, those uh, walks where we um, asked the people, um, let's walk around. And it was open to the uh, people with dementia. Uh, they have chosen where to walk. So they choose the um, destination. 
and um, two researchers um, accompanied um, the people with dementia. One person was really walking and talking, and the other uh, researcher took photos and notes and um, did some um, observatory uh, job. And um, showing those um, results, we um, managed to um, compile based on the um, interviews and, and the walks we undertook. We found out that there are mainly four uh, different patterns. Uh, one pattern, we called it um, always straight ahead. So that is um, a quite interesting pattern uh, and um, it is uh, the fact that a person um, chooses a street and just walks straight ahead until a certain point. So it was not clear for us where, so to say, the end point uh, was for from that uh, uh, person, but um, first the, the people walk straight ahead until they reach a specific point, and then uh, the person turns round and walks back straight the same um, path and the same trip that uh, the person just walked on the other direction. And um, we also reflected a little bit as far as, as it was possible with the people with dementia, why did they um, choose that um, destination or why did they choose this or that direction. And uh, we got also the answer that uh, if people just walk straight ahead and then turn around, then that is also seen as a strategy for not getting lost because they just walk forward and backward. And uh, that pattern, um, we um, face that pattern not only um, in the well-known surround surrounding of uh, people in, in their uh, familiar surroundings uh, of their home, but also in um, more unfamiliar neighborhoods, because uh, we also uh, face that pattern uh, with a person who was um, a guest in a day t daycare center in uh, specific dementia homes, so not staying overnight, but just um, being in the daycare center. My daily routine, that is um, a quite interesting um, pattern, and uh, you might also be familiar with that when you maybe think about mobility patterns of people with dementia. That is a pattern where uh, people just walk the same um, route and the same um, well, pathways um, for uh, all of their, their times whenever they walk that um, specific route. So they have fixed routes and the respective person um, undertakes um, that route um, for several days or several times a week or even several times a day. And uh, we experience that these uh, people having or undertaking that mobility pattern, that they really are absolutely 100% aware what goes on in the neighborhood. So they are really very um, uh, interested and they know about if, if some neighbors have changed their curtains or um, if, they, uh, if there are some construction work um, on the path and they uh, and we had all, we got also the impression that the people really um, change the street from one side to the other really on the specific um, um, on, on the specific um, situation and that they would never uh, walk uh, on the wrong side from their perspective on the wrong side of the road so they really um, use the daily routines uh, my destination, my bench, that is um, something what uh, we um, faced quite often with people with dementia and maybe that's also related to the fact how we, that we ask the people, um, let's uh, go for a walk and you may uh, choose where to go and then people um, had a specific destination in mind and then uh, we had the possibility to echo mine them to that specific destination. And uh, the fourth pattern that is uh, located on the right hand side on the lower, um, in the lower image that is, uh, we called it the journey is the goal. 
and that is um, maybe uh, that mobility pattern that is maybe a little bit of a stereotype for people with dementia. Um, it, uh, with some participants in our um, a combined walk, we just stro strolled around with them, and having no, we did not have any clue where to walk, and it seems that also uh, the people with dementia um, had, did not have any clue where to, uh, what, what would be um, the destination. Um, f the example that we have illustrated in, in that um, example, it was a person who wanted um, to walk with us to a historical park. So first of all, she really had um, a clear picture of her destination, but um, the destination somehow disappeared as soon as we left the uh, residential building and uh, being uh, in, in the out in the public space uh, the person decided to walk to, um, to a small park nearby the building and then she suddenly um, ended up at in the front of a fence and then um, on the way back she spontaneously turned uh, to, and, and then she wanted to explore the other part of the park and it was always uh, we also always had the impression that um, each step is a new step and uh, that the person really um, just walks because of walking so that's why we also um, labeled that um, mobility pattern the journey is the goal um, and uh, we also uh, faced that um, mobility pattern also with a person um, that we uh, combined uh, using the public transport system. And um, it always seems that when people turn uh, right or left and then they see something new, then um, the journey becomes new again. And um, especially with the case I mentioned um, the first case I, me I mentioned, we also faced some ethical issues because then um, we really had to uh, interrupt and um, bring the person back home because our, it was um, we really had the impression that the person would never um, find the way back to the residential home again. So um, let's sum up what um, are the wishes and needs of people um, with dementia based on our um, pieces of research and what could be um, the recommendations that are also relevant for transport planners and urban planners. So um, on, first of all, um, people with dementia, they always asked for other people and they wanted human beings, um, having people around them and um, having really people who accompanied them. So that was really one of the overall wishes and that it's also due to the fact um, that especially in the caring homes, um, people with dementia are not by the regulation, they are not allowed to leave the homes by themselves, so they always have to be accompanied. So that's also why people really want to be accompanied. They uh, want to have a person who is really walking, uh, do, um, undertaking the walks with them. And um, from the perspective of people with dementia, uh, one really main issue, and we discussed it also with representatives um, of the city of Vienna, also with um, Wiener Linien, uh, with the transport operator of the city of Vienna, uh, it's about the reduction of stimuli. So um, orientation um, is an issue, is a main issue for people with dementia. And uh, when we look in our public spaces, especially um, in bigger towns, um, it happens that um, numerous signs, advertisements, information and so on are around in our public spaces and that um, overstimulation should be minimized um, in order to meet the wishes and the needs of people with dementia. Um, Orientation is very important for people with dementia and that also causes a clear and um, an easy orientation. 
People with dementia also ask for um, certain facilities in public spaces. So that's on one hand toilets, but also uh, seats and um, spaces where they can uh, just wait and uh, find some quiet spaces where they can relax, sit down. And accessibility is, um, of course, also important for people with dementia, but um, not mainly because they have suffer from dementia, but um, dementia mainly um, is, is, um, is something that um, is a phenomenon that is mainly related to people, to elderly people, and then uh, elderly people also um, sometimes have mobility issues and need um, uh, some, some facilities that help them to walk. So um, to sum up, dementia-friendly planning um, from my point of view is uh, on one hand um, includes barrier-free planning. So all we know from barrier-free town planning and accessibility is um, a part of dementia-friendly planning, but um, dementia-friendly planning also um, means that we focus on the cognitive dimension. So um, barrier-free planning, we know lots of, of um, what, what, what are the challenges for people who suffer from walking impairments and who are dependent on rollators, wheelchairs, walking sticks, and so on. But um, as f um, to include also the perspective of people with dementia, we have to think about the cognitive dimension too. So, um, summing up and um, coming to the end of, of my lecture, I want to give you just um, some general recommendation from the perspective of um, transport planning with the focus of, this, uh, with the focus of um, gender dimension and um, focusing also um, the needs of um, people with um, caring responsibilities. Um, first of all, and that's um, from my point of view something that we can't underlie, um, we have to underlie it all the time, uh, awareness raising, so it is still uh, necessary to raise awareness about uh, caregivers' mobility patterns and also about mobility patterns of people with dementia and uh, about the importance of um, the social and gender dimension in mobility urban planning in general. So that is something that we have to work on um, again and again. And um, especially for um, people with caring responsibilities, multimodal transport systems, focusing last and first and last mile is very important because uh, when we focus not only on um, car driving but also on other multimodal transport system, then uh, we have um, some services that can also be used by dependent people, such as children or people who haven't got a driving license. Um, active mobility, such as walking, cycling, um, especially uh, when you accompany children, is uh, very important, and it also causes uh, raised uh, quality um, of the means of transportation, um, comfort in buses, trams, bike lanes, but not only in the um, facilities and in the, in the vehicles per se, but also um, on, uh, when, when we look at the um, stations and the bus stops and what about the equipment of those um, built facilities. So, and um, gender dimension in planning, so that is for those um, uh, experts in the audience who um, also work on uh, gender mainstreaming in research or gender mainstreaming in organizations or in institutions. These, um, well, recommendations are not new, but it's uh, still important that we also uh, think about um, gender dimensions in planning. So um, it is, has something to do with um, equal equality in terms of um, actors, so who are the relevant people, and we know from um, various statistical, um, um, well, research and, and uh, statistical evidence that there is still a gender imbalance also in planning, especially when it comes to planning decision-making positions. 
um, equal opportunity for all genders. So it's uh, absolutely important that we uh, think about equal opportunities without stereotyping gender roles, um, gender mainstreaming and gender equality in organizations. And last but not least, um, as for mobility and town planning, urban planning, it's um, also quite important to uh, focus on the gender dimension in the research content. And I hope that um, with my lecture, I, give, I could give you some insights how it is possible to integrate also the gender dimension in mobility research. And my last slide, and that should also be the basis, I hope, for your questions and also for um, the discussion. Um, let me um, point out some challenges um, that, um, from my point of view, from a practitioner's point of view, what are still the challenges when integrating the gender dimension in mobility research, in urban planning, there are lots of um, challenges, but um, among others, um, the main importance, and I would like to um, introduce these challenges to you, and um, maybe we can have a discussion on that. Um, it is, um, well, still a challenge to uh, communicate uh, the intersectionality of gender and diversity issues to um, people working in planning authorities or um, taking um, decision-making positions and, and, and roles in public transport um, operating institutions, organizations. And um, what, due to the um, fact that I have um, carried out several uh, projects in, um, inter and trans, with inter- and transdisciplinary approaches, I think um, it is absolutely necessary to have that inter- and transdisciplinary um, projects and, and um, well, implementing gender equality really as an uh, inter- and transdisciplinary team, but that uh, causes lots of challenges because of um, communication, uh, different um, approaches, different um, understanding of terms of um, disciplines and um, also um, when, when we look at um, the participatory approaches that are taught and used in the uh, planning disciplines and um, transport planning, town planning um, from, from the fields of science, they really come from the engineering and the uh, technology um, universities of technology and they, um, well, it seems that uh, engineer, uh, engineers, they, when they um, want to integrate um, people and when they want to integrate also communities, then um, it seems that uh, the um, participatory approach and process ends when people have just raising their voice. So it ends when people just um, talk and, and share their experiences. And um, planners, especially town planners, transport planners, they are not um, so much willing and accepting uh, that people and the users and uh, the inhabitants or transport public um, yeah, users uh, that they really also take part in the decision making. So that is, from my point of view, also one of those um, challenges um, due to the interdisciplinary um, approach, and that is really needed. But in fact, we also um, face challenges. Um, it would be important that uh, we talk about social and fair rules of interaction and that also includes something like um, active listening instead, um, instead of active question, questioning. So, um, but that is um, something that is also related to um, a good cooperative work and in fact um, from my point of view it's really necessary to uh, take up several pilot projects and really uh, to work in an inter and um, especially also in a transdisciplinary team uh, in order to um, meet the needs of um, people 
all peoples, of all genders, and um, to transfer the needs really into a built environment and built structures. So that is um, also the main job of transport planners and urban planners. Thank you. your great amazing uh, lecture uh, it was I think um, uh, it's so many levels it was so interesting but I have uh, one question um, concerning your uh, your career uh, I would like to know if uh, you ever experienced some ex like um, resistance from the side of municipality or policy makers when you framed your work with gender mainstreaming uh, because I think that uh, for example in Austria is probably a different situation than in Czech Republic like that you are a bit ahead uh, in those equality issues but uh, when you mention that those intersectional um, themes are so important how um, how do the mm -hmm. react? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that um, interesting question. Uh, in fact, um, I work as um, a self-employed researcher and um, consultant, and um, I quite often face um, the problem. And uh, from a personal point of view, I. Sometimes it, it's, um, I'm quite disappointed, but the fact is um, we carry out pieces of research and then what is really very important for, for my company is that we transfer these, piece, these research really into practical recommendations, especially for mobility of people with dementia. We have a website, recommendations, uh, general recommendations um, that are dedicated to um, interested audience and also Tumblr and so on. And then we also have uh, developed really very specific recommendation for the city of Vienna, for the public transport operators, not only in that project, but also in others. So really hands-on recommendations. And then um, I really faced the problem. So I have to uh, go to those um, institutions, present our results, and now we have the recommendations. And the problem is I am not responsible and I am not in the position of implementing these recommendations in practice because I am an independent consultant and researcher and I'm not in the decision-making position of a town planning of a municipality or authority neither a transport operator and um, in fact uh, Especially, it, it, um, it came in my mind uh, with working with people with dementia. That is, uh, for sure, a specific target group. And the problem, um, when I try to bring my recommendations into practice or find counterparts in municipalities or other authorities, the problem is that um, gender, social issues and planning, they um, are mainly not in one department and when it comes to municipalities and um, the political sphere, um, at least in Austria, it's quite often the, f um, the fact that these um, two issues are not under the same, let's say, political party responsibility. So on one hand, it's, it's maybe the, the more social democrats um, who are responsible for social issues and the town planning, at least in the city of Vienna, town planning, transport planning is um, under the green, it, uh, the green party is responsible. And then it is, uh, you can't talk with those, with the politicians about the content because they just look on their specific yeah. responsibilities. And then when you come with a cross-cutting issue, that's, that's also a problem. So it's, but I, I think it's not, um, it's a, it's a systematic problem and it's not um, I think that the, the problem other other people will also would also face the same difficulties mm -hmm. 
there anyone who wants to ask something? Do we have a question that uh, came by Slido? We have two questions, mm -hmm. Slido. Uh, the first is, on the way to the conference center, did you notice any gender non-sensitive points in Prague? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I walked uh, straight ahead from uh, the main station here and I was just um, uh, impressed by the pavements here in, in Prague and I did not have any time to have a closer look, but... Um, Maybe I'll do mm -hmm. <laughs> And the second question is, which improvements in urban planning or transportation that were made thanks to the integration of gender perspective do you find to be the most important? Could you repeat the uh, middle part, yeah, part again? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read it yeah. again. Which improvements in uh -huh. urban planning or transport, uh, transportation that were made thanks to the integration of gender perspective uh -huh. do you find to be the most important? Mm, it's um, not so easy to um, have an overall answer to that, but in fact, um, when I look at the um, um, activities in the city of Vienna, so as, as I mentioned with the Frauenwerkstatt, um, I think they did a really very good job taking up that competition by um, architects, female architects, and then uh, included the findings in the housing subsidies procedures so that uh, it, it really became part of the decision-making processes when, um, well, companies ask for subsidies when they build a house. Um, and um, a, a minor, really a very, very tiny, 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 um, well, challenge and, and, and success um, might be that um, when I presented uh, the analysis and the results um, on the travel survey methods, I mentioned that I, it was uh, the, my, my PhD thesis. And um, when we look at the questionnaires um, of the Austrian travel survey that was conducted in 2013, 2014, uh, they included uh, more purposes um, I did not translate the, but I can go back and show you the, the it's uh, these results. So when we look at the um, purposes that they um, included, they also uh, included Besuch, that means um, visiting somebody. So in fact, they took up, um, it's not, not only my success, but uh, they took up the um, critique um, that was around on, on travel purposes. Um, and in fact, um, within that study, there were three uh, different um, opportunities how people could participate. On one hand, a written questionnaire, an online questionnaire, and a telephone interview. And um, as for the telephone interview and the um, uh, online questionnaire, they also included the question, with whom did you undertake the trip? So that was, uh, from my point of view, I think that is uh, one um, success. Yeah, uh, but in fact, um, they said it was not possible to include that question with whom um, did you undertake the trip because of uh, page limitations on the written questionnaire because they said it uh, is only allowed to be an A3 piece of paper and they did not have enough space. But in, in fact, for the, for the um, when, when people answered via online, uh, the online um, questionnaire and uh, telephone, but in fact, I think um, two, no, uh, th um, three quarter um, answered the questionnaire with the written questionnaire, so it's uh, just a minor database. I wonder if you have some uh, idea of side effects of your research when your respondents, for example, experience this uh, 
other interviews or some mm -hmm. questionnaires. So if it somehow influenced their, their minds, if there's some idea and they, for example, started to act somehow and make some pressure on the, mm -hmm. the municipal authorities, if, if there is this, if, if it could mm -hmm. happen or if we have some idea if it happens. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know exactly because um, it was not possible for us to have a follow-up with our um, interview mm -hmm. partners, but in fact, um, uh, as I mentioned, um, with um, in that project, um, Mobility Patterns of People with Caring Responsibilities, uh, we also worked together with several municipalities and uh, as for the city in Graz, um, it was, uh, we, we asked or we tried to find our interview partners um, with the help of a snowball effect and we asked the municipality and um, uh, the department who is responsible for um, family activities to support us and uh, they sent out uh, an email and um, told about our um, request that we are searching for um, interview partners. And then over the night, we received, I think, 15 positive responses. And that was really also a highlight because, um, as you all probably know, it's not so easy to find interview partners. And then people were very happy and eager to um, be on act as interview partners um, because uh, the it was a community that was um, already um, engaged in mobility issues. And then I think that maybe the reflection, and, and because we um, carried out uh, interviews that lasted for one hour or even longer, and then we also asked what was the day, the, um, the trips you undertook yesterday, and then we also had um, town maps and people had to draw their trips of uh, the day before. And we re, re, um, also reflected, and they, they really reflected their day-to-day -day patterns and, and um, uh, told us about uh, the problems that they face in the specific street because the pavements are not uh, properly maintained or uh, the bus station and so on. And, and uh, so we really have um, a huge um, um, yeah, treasure of information. Um, but that's what is, it's also one of the problems we tried to, so to say, sell that information also to the municipalities. But in, in fact, uh, we did not succeed because they, no one um, paid us for an in-depth analysis. And for sure, it was quite obvious that the ministry said that they are, for, for obvious reasons, not interested in those detailed information. So we had uh, we we did uh, the coding for all those interviews, and also labeled this information dedicated to this or that town. But uh, in fact, mm, they didn't take take it up. So, but that that's always I think the the problem in in um, research institutes because when when you do qualitative research, you get so much insight, and then. You have so many ideas where to um, further investigate or further uh, develop recommendations. And um, even it was really a, a quite huge project, but also um, our resources were limited. But I, I think may, maybe it, it, it uh, could or it should be important that we also uh, include more participatory uh, reflections in the pieces of research mm -hmm. and in the project with people with dementia um, we had um, also a focus group um, with um, ProMens that is um, a group where um, people with dementia gather and they um, set up their own um, um, association and they really um, act um, as spokespersons for themselves. And then we reflected our results, um, what we uh, learned from the people with the combined walks and the um, narrative interviews, and we um, presented our results to those people with dementia who really act as spokesperson. And then it was very uh, interesting because they absolutely underlined uh, our results and, and um, validated it in a very positive way. And it was also, we were very happy that 
it seems that we really uh, found out what is really the need of, of the people. And 